it is to welcome you most heartily uh, to Paris State Capture and its aftermath conference. When I saw the hashtag State Capture After Capture, I thought perhaps this was a little pre premature, but I'm sure the conference itself will spend a lot of time unpacking and probing the meaning of whether we're in a state of after capture and doing this from multiple perspectives. Our national context is one in which, despite a declared new dawn and despite determined efforts of new commissions of inquiry to confront accumulation via the state in, in the Zuma period, there are new revelations on a daily basis. In the city press, only the city press yesterday, there were stories of theft, not only of the bank, of provinces and par parastatals, but also a key department in the state. It's an ongoing saga. It's not new, and it's something that needs continued investigation. It's a context that demands analysis, and it demands action. It demands historical and comparative analysis, and it demands insights from all disciplines, not only to look at the different dimensions of state capture, but also to consider the possibilities for moving forward and the implications of different possibilities. Now, PARI's excellent analytical and research track record has been characterized by, and it's also benefited from, bringing together researchers and policymakers, um, often to speak across very deep chasms of understanding and experience. Um, but it's been an important initiative, and I'm very glad and happy to see that it's happening in this conference too. We will have people from government, we will have researchers from leading institutions, and especially also I want to welcome researchers from North America, from South America, from uh, different parts of Africa, as well as from some of our leading research institutions here in South Africa. Thank you for coming, and welcome to all of you, also to this UJ campus on which I am incidentally based. Um, that, it is, that this conference has drawn so many of you from different parts of the world, as well as from South Africa, testifies to the urgency of the issues, to the need for a space to reflect, to learn from one another, and to consider alternatives. So moving forward, I just want to especially welcome and thank Judge Zach Yacoub, whom Bongiseni Butelezi will introduce, for agreeing to come and do the keynote at this conference. I also want to thank the donors for their, conference, uh, for their confidence in the work of PARI, and especially Yellowwoods, OSF South Africa, Wright, the Millennium Trust, and the Social Justice Initiative. Thank you very much for funding this conference. Civil society partners are also contributing to the round tables on the final day, and thank you to them too, and welcome as well. So to all of you, a hearty welcome. I hope you enjoy this conference, and I hope we will all learn um, in the course of it. But I would like to introduce you now to Mbongiseni Butelezi, the new executive director of PARI. Mbongiseni Butelezi, who many of you may know, joined PARI as a research manager in 2016. Before joining PARI, he held numerous research and teaching positions at the University of Cape Town, including senior researcher in the then Rural Women's Action Research Unit for the Center of Law and Society. He holds a PhD in English and Comparative Literature from Columbia University, and he writes on rural governance, governance in South Africa, particularly the interface between traditional authorities, rural residents, and the state. Mbongiseni. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, in line with Vishanti's paperless revolution, I've, tra I've tried um, to, to also uh, follow uh, uh, suit and, and have no paper. So I'm going to uh, try and read my notes off my laptop. Let's see if that works. Sanbonani, Huemore. I won't do what, what we normally do in South Africa, which is greet people in all the 11 official languages. I'll just stop there. So, um, keynote speaker, uh, former Justice of the Constitutional Court, uh, Zach Yacoub. Chair of the PARI Board, Linda Chisholm. Mrs. Anu Yacoub. PARI Board members, 
funders, representatives of government institutions, representatives of foreign missions, panelists uh, and participants from far and wide, and members of the PARI team, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Let me start with um, a, a painful subject. The opening of this conference marks a bittersweet sweet moment uh, for many of us at PARI and for me personally. Let me begin with a bitter. We have walked a long and at times arduous road to get to this conference. The founding director, now former director of PARI, Ivor Chipkin, led PARI's work that has resulted in this conference. He and I and other colleagues brainstormed the after capture program into being in the hallways of PARI. It should have been Ivor standing here in front of you at this moment. But today he's not here to take part in this conference. I begin with this not to air Paris laundry in public, but because we have received many questions in the lead up to this conference, with many people, some of whom are sitting in this room, wondering whether they should continue to associate themselves with Paris after the news of Ivar's resignation from the organization was published uh, in a newspaper a month ago. I have decided to address the matter openly and upfront so that we can move past it and have what I trust will be a robust and fruitful conference over the next three days. Ivar Chipkin has indeed left PARI, the organization he founded in 2010, and uh, which he built from scratch to what it is today. He resigned following an investigation into complaints uh, related to abuse of power and sexual harassment leveled against him. From an organizational point of view, I think the point I want to make is I can safely say an independent process uh, led by the Gender Equity Office at WITS was initiated to in investigate and resolve the complaints. It was while the process was still ongoing um, and had not reached its conclusion that Iva resigned. I want to assure all of you that PARI, with the close involvement of the board, um, is emerging into a new place. After a difficult and very painful past few months, we are growing from strength to strength as we undertake processes of healing and repair in the organization. Hence this conference. Let me come to the sweet part. The conference marks a sweet moment, also precisely because we have walked a long path to get through a rapidly changing political context to get here. We begin this conference at a very different time to the context in which it was first conceived. Many of the issues we're going to discuss in the next three days are now the subject of commissions, such as um, the Zondo Commission, uh, the Nugent Commission, and now the recently announced uh, um, like Nigeria, Brazil, Angola, and India and others. We hope to come out of this conference provoked, energized, and emboldened to undertake the important work that needs to continue to be done to analyze and critique, but also to mobilize. I'm pleased to say that uh, civil society groups uh, convened by colleagues from Open Secrets who are in the room are making uh, submissions uh, to the Zondo Commission. My hope is that the conversations uh, and the critiques that we undertake over the next three days will generate new thinking about things we need to do together as civil society and with committed civil servants in many parts of the state in the short and in the long term to rebuild our deeply damaged um, state uh, for it to serve the needs of those that most need the state. And here we're talking about the jobless, uh, we're talking about the people most in need of housing, we're talking about asylum seekers, the aged, and then the indigent. Once again, to uh, reiterate uh, what the chair of the board said, thank you for joining us at this momentous conference. We hope to continue the conversation well beyond uh, this conference and deepen the learnings from the next three days over many years to come with our partners from around the country and from Latin America and other parts of, uh, of, South of Africa and from the United States. Let me then end by introducing very briefly our speaker, our esteemed speaker. 
Zach Yacoub uh, is, the is a retired justice of the Constitutional Court. He served on the Constitutional Court from 1998 uh, to 2018, 13, I beg your pardon. He hails from Durban and has had a very long and distinguished career, including representing and advising many people pro prosecuted for contravening security laws, uh, emergency measures, and other oppressive legislation under apartheid. He was also involved um, in representing victims of unfair evictions and people who were required to pay unfair housing tariffs uh, in Durban in particular. He was a member of the executive of the Natal Indian Congress uh, from 1981 to 1991, in which capacity he organized and took part in many protests, produced and distributed publicity material, and organized and addressed many uh, anti-apartheid mass meetings. He was a member of the executive of the Durban Housing Action Committee from 82 to 85 and was involved in action aimed at ensuring that the Durban City Council managed its housing schemes fairly. He has since then uh, also advised many local government bodies, the National Land Committee and the Department of Finance. And generally since uh, his retirement from the Constitutional Court, he's been, I think for many of us, a voice of um, reason, a voice, a sage voice that has said many things uh, that many people were unable to say. And so with that, may I invite Zach Yacoub to address us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much for uh, having me Thanks. open this uh, very, very important conference, not only for the future of South Africa, but I would say that for the future of, 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 of working democracies in various regions and even regions throughout the world. It's a very important initiative which we must take extremely seriously. We need to discuss matters openly and appropriately and make sure that the recommendations that come out of the conference are practical in nature and take things forward. I'm going to address a number of issues in the hope that those issues will help us look at the nature of the problem. Broadly, what we have to do in the next few days is to deepen our understanding of exactly why state capture happened, what were the circumstances that gave rise to it, what were its consequences, and the steps that we need to take to reform the state. For unless we are honest about the full causes of state capture, unless we face state capture in its absolute entirety, even if we hide one small element away and refuse to face it and refuse to bring it into the overall analysis, our solutions would be wrong. So let us be completely frank with each other and let us look at each of these things as they occurred. Let us then start with, and, and, and one of the problems is that state capture is associated with Zuma, People tend to think that Jacob Zuma was the cause of the problem. People tend to think that somehow, miraculously, now that Jacob Zuma is gone, everything is going to come right virtually automatically. My thesis is that while Zuma behaved miserably badly, he is not the only cause of the problem. That the causes go far back that the causes go as far back as the supply of arms to South Africa during anti-apartheid, during apartheid times, in breach of international sanctions, that the problems go far back to the arms deal, the problems more recently in relation to state capture, the problems concern the way in which the state conducted its activities, it concerns the whole of the cabinet 
as it operated in our country, not only before 1994, but from 1994 to now. And that you will find that there are very, very few people in power who will be able to say that they had nothing or very little to do with it. In a sense, I hope I will show that the extent of the problem is huge, that the solution is going to be a very difficult one, and there are some prerequisites which we will have to enter into. First, of course, to go to the causes in the past. Many of you, I think, were present at uh, about, about a month ago when we delivered a report of the Economic Crimes Tribunal, which came to a number of very important and useful conclusions. And I would commend that report to all of you to read quite carefully as the backdrop of the discussion that we are going to have here. Basically, there were a number of findings made by the International uh, uh, Economic Crimes Tribunal. The first is that there was a breach of international law. There was the commission of much crime. There was a, a system of money transfers which was set up by a whole range of commercial institutions. There was collaboration by a whole range of other governments to break the arms sanction and to make sure that South Africa managed to procure arms through all sorts of unlawful, improper means. And the difficulty is that once you get into this impropriety, and if you do not sort it out, you have a huge problem. So I want to say to you that the problems of state capture actually go right back to that point in time when there were, there were sanctions busting by the evil apartheid regime. But the problems go worse than that because somehow our governments ended up being complicit, even the democratic government. The Truth and Reconciliation didn't look, a commission didn't look at these areas very carefully. One would have expected that punishment of all these people for the commission of these international crimes would have been absolutely essential to the reconstruction of our society. And it is the report of the tribunal, and it is something I agree with completely, that one of the things we need to do is to come to terms with this, to make sure that appropriate steps are taken by the government and everybody else to resolve these problems and to make sure that everybody involved there is properly prosecuted as soon as is possible, even though much time has elapsed. And there's a problem, because if you don't prosecute these crimes, then the dirty, unfinished history remains. And for some reason, once you allow huge criminals of this kind to, set, to, to, to go free, you start on a different moral compass. You start by beginning to think that crime doesn't always have to be punished. That there are circumstances in which crime can be swept under the carpet. And once a democracy starts on that basis, we've got very, very serious problems. Because pushing crimes under the carpet becomes, shall we say, a kind of habit. Then the next thing that happened, of course, and all of you are aware of that, is the arms deal in our country. Again, nobody has properly been prosecuted. There has not been proper investigation. It is quite clear that crime was committed. It is quite clear, too, that the arms deal was actually a continuation of what happened during apartheid. Had it not been for the sanctions busting operations, the arms deal could not have taken place as easily. Had those people been prosecuted then, the arms deal could not have taken place that easily. So the arms deal, in an odd way, 
was a continuation of sanction busting, except that now people involved in our democratic government were making the money and doing things wrongly. It wasn't the white apartheid people who were doing these things. And finally, as a result of the arms deal, came state capture of the kind that we know it. And again, there is a continuity. If you understand the facts carefully, the sanctions busting leads to arms deal, arms deal leads to state capture, and therefore there's a great deal of unwinding to be done before we work out the direction in which we're going to go and what we're going to do. So let us not blame Zuma only. Let us have an interesting understanding of where we are going and understand this at its roots. So I want to say firstly that in order to get the society right, it is absolutely urgent for all international sanctions busting crimes to be prosecuted either in South Africa or in international crimes tribunals so that we begin to make a clean start because you can't clean things at the top alone. You've got to clean things right from where things started. So a prerequisite would be the prosecution of these people. A prerequisite, secondly, is to go into the arms deal carefully, see what crimes were committed, and ensure that these crimes are appropriately prosecuted. And then, of course, state capture too. One needs to go into it very, very carefully and make sure that prosecutions happen. Because unless prosecutions happen, unless people are punished for what they've done, our society is... This is not the kind of crime where any kind of truth and reconciliation can work. And then I will say a word about commissions and warn that commissions can be quite satisfying. Commissions, if enough of them are appointed, can blunt the edge. And very, very often, and I'm not saying that it is the case with the commissions that we have now, I'm just warning that very often that happens with the arms deal commission. What happens is that commissions take a long time, uh, they make recommendations, and as evidence is revealed before the commission, people begin to feel satisfied that things are being done, it is a false sense of satisfaction to think that once there are commission recommendations and commission findings placing blame where that blame belongs, the problem is actually over. In my view, it is absolutely dangerous to have a situation in which you stop at commissions and leave it right there because then the commissions become a way in which you ultimately don't prosecute people. So what I must say very, very strongly is that if all these commissions are not followed by criminal prosecution for the crime that people did, then I'm afraid we're not going to get anywhere. So we need to ensure a good policing system we need to ensure a good prosecution system. We need to get, get international help if, if possible. But we need to help our government along to get this right. If we don't reform the police system, don't reform the prosecution system, we're not going to get very, very far. As I understand it, there's a consultation process now for the appointment of the National Prosecuting Authority person. But you see, there are other more difficult problems. And I want to address the argument that Zuma was the only one at fault. The thinking is that Zuma appointed the National Director of Public Prosecutions badly. The thinking is that Zuma appointed the police bosses at various levels. The, thing is, the, the, the thinking is that because Zuma made all these appointments, and somebody has said 
that the president is being given too much power. And that is why we have that, that these things happen. But what we need to realize is that Zuma, in terms of the constitution, the president of the country has no power to make these appointments on his own. The national director of public prosecutions, judges in our country, the appointments of commissions as well, they are all functions in terms of section 85 of the constitution. And all these functions are performed by the president in consultation with the cabinet. So it is the president, the deputy president, and each and every member of the cabinet which is responsible for each of these decisions and they must actually take responsibility. Now, one of two things, either members of cabinet and the deputy president at the different times did not read the constitution at all and didn't understand what their responsibilities were, in which case they are criminally responsible. Alternatively, and this might, I don't know which is worse. Alternatively, they knew what their responsibilities were these decisions were all taken at cabinet meetings where each and every minister would be responsible. But now it is convenient to put the blame on somebody else. So when you talk about the appointment of police seat, when you talk about the appointment of the, national, uh, the, the prosecuting authority, when you talk about any disciplinary proceedings, all these matters that uh, in relation with, uh, to which decisions have been taken, cabinet takes the decision. So I think it is very important for the future for ministers to understand their responsibilities in accordance with the constitution. They must understand their responsibilities sufficiently and take collective responsibility for what happens. Part of the problem is maybe that our ministers need to be educated on what their constitutional responsibilities are. I just wonder how many cabinet ministers have studied sections 84 and 85 of the Constitution. How many people realize that the whole of the cabinet is responsible? And I think that that is one thing that people must begin to understand very, very clearly. Otherwise, we are not going to get anywhere at all. Having said that, we need to ensure the appointment of proper public prosecutors, proper policemen, uh, all must be done through a proper pro process. And I think what has been started now, a consultation process for the appointment of the National Director of Public Prosecutions, might be a very good thing. But it may also be a very good idea, because part of the problem is that in our system of government, the separation of powers between the executive on the one hand and the legislature on the other hand is not worth really much. It's not worth much because of the party system, because of the absence of constituency representation, and because, let's say, the ANC has 62% of the vote in the country, they appoint the cabinet, which comes from the ANC, the ANC determines policy, the ANC is in complete control, and the idea, ordinarily, that members of the African National Congress, who are members of Parliament, are going to bring their own leaders, the senior members of their own political parties, who are cabinet ministers, or the boss of the political party, who is the president of the country, if they are going to, the, the, the notion that the members of the ANC are going to call their own people very seriously to account is a very, very difficult notion indeed. And we understand what happened in Nkandla. It was quite obvious that those things, the, 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 the upgraded work d done there had nothing to do with security. And yet, in my view, people just lied 
to, to, to protect each other. Every mom, member of the cabinet during Yun Khan's time would have known or ought to have known that these security upgrades are not good. They are not acceptable under any circumstances. And yet, nobody, but nobody from the ruling political party, not a single cabinet minister ever said a single thing. So again, cabinet must learn to take its full responsibilities. We must learn to understand our constitution and work that through quite carefully. Then there's another problem. The other problem is about the duties of members of parliament. We all know that members of parliament get sworn in and they undertake to uphold the constitution and the law to protect it and to uphold it. The president does, each cabinet member does, each member of parliament does. And the interesting question which we've got to work out is what do members of parliament do if what they are asked to do by the African National Congress as Congress members, and that applies to each and every political party, do they vote in accordance with their own consciences in terms of the constitution? in terms of their duty to uphold the Constitution, in terms of their duty to be responsive and accountable, in terms of their duty to be honest and open, or does taking the oath in Parliament which says, I will uphold the Constitution, have the words, I will uphold the Constitution, been substituted somehow in the minds of so many people as if the oath in Parliament says, I shall follow the African National Congress. And the oath in Parliament does not say that. So we've now got to understand what the oath in Parliament means. Polit all political parties need to understand the Constitution, need to know their Constitution, and understand that their duty, and this does not apply only to the African National Congress, this applies to every political party in power. There must be a very clear understanding that the duty of members of parliament is to uphold the constitution. I think we may need to start thinking about some other ways, and unless we get it right, we may have to think about some other ways of ensuring an appropriate separation of powers between the executive and, and others. Then there is a difficult problem of people wanting to make money easily. And that history has a very interesting root. That history has a root in apartheid. That history has a root which, 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 which shows us that most of the members of parliament who got into a new parliament in 1994 were actually very, very poor people. They had absolutely nothing, which is not the case in many other countries where parliamentarians normally have a house or something of that sort. So they were very poor and capital moved into the bargain quite quickly. Capital was very quick in beginning to understand <coughs> that there is a weakness here. So we all know that this kind of corruption that we are talking about do not represent the actions of government alone. They represent the conduct of capital and the government. Civil society on the one hand and government on the other. You must have two parties to a corrupt deal, not only one. And therefore, the private sector cannot disclaim responsibility. In most of these cases, the private sector is as responsible as the public sector. And therefore, the work that is necessary 
is not aimed at reforming the private sector, the public sector alone. I think that the private sector must take full responsibility. It is the duty of organizations of this kind to make sure that the private sector takes full responsibility. Otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere with that either. At the moment, the private sector, particularly capital in this country, and business in this country, take the view that what they have done is all absolutely and utterly correct, and that the fault lines are only in government. The trouble is that there are fault lines in civil society, there are fault lines in, in, in political parties, of course. There are fault lines within capital. There are fault lines where there is greed in capital and greed in government. And somehow, we have to ensure that we have a program where people understand that capital, too, is a serious guilty party in all of this. And that if we think that problem can be solved by simply reforming government, it is not going to work at all. There must be a new way in which we, in the private sector, begin to look at the way in which we conduct our lives. Because there is an interaction between the way in which the private sector conduct their lives on the one hand, and what happens in the public sector. Corruption can only happen if two people clap hands. And therefore, the change that we need to bring about is not limited to the public sector alone. It is also limited to, to, to it also in, it embraces the private sector. And then, of course, in the public and private sector, there is a need for constitutional education. You would have noticed that while there was a lot of talk about the Constitution and ensuring that the constitutional injunctions be fulfilled, when we started our uh, government, uh, the, our democracy in 1994, as time has gone on, the reference to the Constitution has become less and less and less. And I wonder how many parliamentarians understand our Bill of Rights how many parliamentarians understand precisely what their duties are in terms of the Constitution? How many parliamentarians understand their responsibilities of uh, accountability and openness? By the way, I, uh, when I retired as a judge, I made an offer to Parliament that I'm quite happy to conduct classes on their understanding of the Constitution free of charge. My letter did not even receive an answer, <laughs> despite the fact that it was followed up by a few more letters later. So again, parliamentarians, the constitution has got to come to the forefront. The values of our constitution of dignity, human dignity, equality and freedom, the improvement of the quality of lives of all our people, so there must be an understanding of these constitutional obligations amongst all political parties and upon everyone who governs us at every level, otherwise we're not going to get anywhere. And part of this also is that hopefully we'll get to the situation where our children will start learning our, about our constitutional values, that we will have introduced in schools our constitutional obligations, that when they grow up and they get into business, whether they get into uh, business or whether they get into government, they are infused with the values of our constitution. The problem is that at every level, our constitution and its values of openness and democracy and so on have taken a back seat. Its values in relation to caring for vulnerable people is not there. And therefore, there's a great deal of work to be done to ensure that the values of our Constitution are understood by more and more people, that they are embraced by more and more people. And as more and more people in our country begin to live the values of our Constitution, 
in the long term, that is the only route to go. If the people in our country, more and more of them, began to live the values of our constitution, the chances of government malpractice are likely to go down considerably because hopefully the politician who will come into power, who goes to school today and learns about the constitution and begins to live its values when the kid is five or six years old, when that person gets into power, even as a president or whatever, when they are 50 or 60, obviously the values of the constitution have been so well imbibed that it is extremely unlikely that anything else will happen. And then, of course, there is the electoral system. The problem is very, very deep because we have many, many poor people in our country. The fact that there are poor people in our country means that poor people become manipulable. And poor people become manipulable by, not by any sophisticated way, when people are poor, when people are starving, when people are absolutely miserable, we've got to face the fact that a piece of Kentucky chicken with a beer or a bottle of Coke buys the vote. So, if our political parties get to buying votes, get to getting votes by, by misrepresenting things and talking lies, which, which many of them do, that is not the basis of a strong democracy. So somehow, they must develop a new ethic within political parties in terms of which people are not forced or tempted to vote in particular directions. Our vo voter education programs have really got to increase to make sure that our, more and more of our voters know what they are doing and are able to make informed choices at the time when they, when they take the vote. And our society should have developed to the situation where the whole of society ought to have cried out against the notion that a man who has had sexual intercourse with a young friend's daughter of his thought that he could have a shower to ensure that he didn't get HIV from her, a man who has had corruption charges withdrawn against him under very, very difficult circumstances. There is a serious problem in the nature of our society if a person of that sort is enamored, valued, and actually made the president of the country. So somehow, we have got to have a public education campaign which makes us all automatically say, no, this person with these values that this approach to life is not good for us. And again, it's the manipulation of poor people, it's the manipulation of people who have less knowledge that gives rise to this kind of problem. So friends, the job is a very difficult one. It starts with the prosecution of those people who have been guilty of offences in the past. It starts with the prosecution of people who, who, who did things now. It, 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 it is about ensuring collective responsibility for what people do. It is about ensuring a societal education in relation to the development of constitutional values. And while we may take a few of these steps, my own view is that this is a huge project. It doesn't get solved in one year or two years or three years or four years. We've got to tackle it carefully, slowly, deliberately, one bit at a time. And if we can say in five years that the value of our society is 5% better than it was five years ago, I think we would have made a, a, a wonderful move forward. So let us not think that there are quick fixes. Let us not think that suddenly when we have one person out of the way, things will change. 
Let us not think that the government is going to become open and responsive immediately. And then, of course, there are interesting uh, things about an understanding by public uh, m members of the public administration and political office bearers about their role in society, their governance role. Ultimately, and you heard this, uh, the, the, the Minister of Police said that he didn't uh, do anything at all to push the prosecution of Boyson. All the Minister did was wanted the police to account to him in relation to that case. Now I ask you, surely a Minister of Police is involved in setting up police structures, appointing people, determining policy, ensuring appropriate training, ensuring that proper systems are set up, and so on and so on. Since when does the Minister of Police want to have reported to him about a particular case that's interfering at the, uh, at the micro level with the work which be done not by politicians, but by professional police people. So I, I end here, uh, and, 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 and I hope that, that, that we'll have some discussion and that we begin to understand the enormity of the task uh, that we have in ensuring that our society is a truly democratic one, based on openness, responsiveness, and accountability, and based on human dignity equality and freedom. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. Right. This one? Okay. Questions? Oh, yeah. Sorry. There we go. Okay. Please. Join me in thanking Zach Yakub for that wide-ranging and stimulating. Um, we find ourselves in a situation where we've been very generous to ourselves with time. We had not intended uh, to open up for discussion at this point, but um, Zach would like to invite uh, conversation if anybody um, has any questions. And then we will, I think, move our tea break uh, earlier so that uh, we can uh, start the ne next session slightly earlier than initially uh, planned. Any initial comments, questions to just get our thinking going? I mean, on, con I mean, on the question of democracy, on the question of um, holding people to account uh, for crimes uh, uh, committed uh, during the apartheid era uh, on questions around um, commissions uh, that uh, Zach has been so provocative about and the ways in which commissions can demobilize us. Any, any thoughts? Here's a first hand. Please. Morning, uh, my name is Joan. Stuff. Um, I'm the policy manager at the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And I just wanted to ask the speaker, you know, what, what his thoughts are on why we kind of shy away from prosecuting to the extent that he says we should. Is it, uh, you know, a fear of what we might find? Is it a fear of our inability to overcome those problems? And your thoughts would be welcome, thanks. Thank you. I'll take a second hand on that side of the room. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. My name I'm with Officers Copeland and NGO based in this land. Um, just to end um, with some thoughts on the electoral process. And rightly so, I mean, it, it has been said that a number of the problems that we are finding ourselves grappling with have a lot to do with the electoral system that we have. And the mere fact that we get members of parliament or members of legislatures who were elected through uh, this system in which very few people participated um, would then find or believe that they cannot 
account to the broader electorate because then they were not elected by it anyway. Um, there's a number of challenges with the current electoral system. And I, 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 I was wondering if you had any thoughts about what possible reforms um, could be in place. I mean, you make a note about um, President Zuma and the caliber of the person that he was at the time, um, and the mere fact that society allowed him to take over this president. And the argument behind that is that society didn't vote him into power, the ANC did. Um, and so, I mean, I'm just interested in your thoughts around reforms um, for the electoral process. Uh, I'll ask uh, Zach to respond to those two, and I'll take another round. There's two other hands, okay. at least. Um, Here you, go. you can just stay there, Zach, if you want to. Just stay here. Okay. Yeah, here's, here's the microphone. Okay, thanks very much. As far as the first question is concerned, there are a number of problems. The first is that prosecutors are not pr properly trained. Um, the second is that we have politicized the whole process. So that if you, for example, have a junior prosecutor earning 500,000 rand a year, and you as the president promote him to become the prosecutor's boss in this country, earning 3.5 million a year, do you think the president needs to ask him to favor him? He's already so, how many of you have ever had a job where from one job to the next, your salary has gone up five fold? So once you make those sorts of appointments, it becomes a problem. So I think appointments is one thing. The training of prosecutors in the, uh, is another thing. The understanding by prosecutors and the whole prosecutor, uh, prosecuting authority that their job is to create a constitutionally acceptable society. Prosecutors don't understand their role. They just go about on a day-to-day -day basis doing their work. And I have found in my own experience that the apartheid prosecutors were really, really doing their job absolutely thoroughly to the extent of being malicious with all of us in those days. Now, that prosecutorial fervor has somehow gone. And I think that there are divisions within the prosecuting authority. So the revival of the prosecution uh, uh, authority is one very important thing, and it doesn't rest on simply appointing a person uh, as the boss of prosecutors. That person who is the boss of prosecutors has to have a vision of how the prosecution system is to be reformed, what sort of training you give to prosecutors, how you ensure that pros prosecutors do their work with a sense of purpose and understand the importance of their work and how good it is and how you develop a system of ethics and credibility and force within the prosecuting authority. It's, 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 it's a long job. It is a difficult job which we have to do. There has to be training, training, training. Otherwise, our prosecutions are never, never, ever going to come right. And we've got to stop the thing about having different strands in the prosecution service. We've got to have somebody who has the vision to unite people as best as they possibly can. As far as the electoral system is concerned, we can talk about the electoral system. But I have to say that for so long as most of our voters are very poor, and for so long as the level of their education does not render them vulnerable to the extent where they can be manipulated to do whatever you want them to do because of poverty and the absence of education, no magical electoral system is going to fix it. Having said that, we have a proportional system, and at the time, in 1995, 1996, when we were negotiating these things, and I was part of that negotiating process, the ANC had actually undertaken that they would, that, that, that this total proportional representation at national and provincial level is going to be a temporary thing, and that very soon, 
a measure of constituency basis we would put into the scheme of things. And the constituency basis would mean that a person gets elected by a particular constituency, by a particular area, and then is responsible to that area. So I think that the building in of some kind of constituency basis in our electoral system will help. But I must stress that it is not a question of, of, uh, of, 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 of electoral systems. It is more a question of the education of people, the strengthening of our people, reaching a situation where we will make really careful, informed choices. And quite apart from that, there are people today even who say the ANC is very bad, it's corrupt and so on and so on. But it's difficult to think of anybody who is different from the ANC. So there are many, many so-called sophisticated people who understand these things who will still say we are forced to vote for the ANC in two years' time. So I don't know. I don't know why people don't form a new political party. So what happens is that the rhythm and the vigor has gone out of our politics. We have begun to take things lying down. We've begun to take the path of least retreat, and I think I think those are where the problems really, really lie. So I, I must emphasize that it's not the electoral system. You can bring in a constituency-based thing and so on; it won't work uh, too much. Another thing is that political parties are constitutional instruments, and therefore all political parties need to commit themselves to the constitution. And there's a problem. There's a problem about that with all political parties. The ANC will not commit itself to the honesty required by the Constitution at all. The DA will not commit itself to the affirmative action part of our Constitution. They'll find it very, very difficult to work its way through. But I think that the, the commitment of political parties to our value systems uh, and our constitutional value systems is a very important part of electoral reform, actually, because it is the political parties which conduct the elections, it is the political parties which fight the elections, and they do so from uh, 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 the perspective, from a constitutionally informed perspective, they are likely to do things a little bit better. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> what do you mean, people? No, 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 but the public voted the political party in when they knew that Zuma was going to be the president of this country. So in 2009, when the people voted the African National Congress into power, they knew that Jacob Zuma was, the pre was going to be the president of this country. They knew about his sexual prowess. They knew about the fact that corruption charges had been withdrawn against him under very difficult circumstances. In other words, they knew he was an out-and-out -out rogue. Nevertheless, they vote for that organization that has an out-and-out -out immoral rogue as its president. So if you vote for a party, whose president is an out-and-out -out known rogue, immoral to the core. What do you expect from the rest of the political party? So, I mean, the business of the people didn't vote for him, does not cut ice, because when they went to vote, they knew that he was going to be their president. And many, many of them knew that he was a rogue. And again, after Nkandla, in 2014, People vote for the ANC again when they try to sidetrack things. So again, we have got to make sure that our people are stronger when it comes to voting and that we are able to understand what we are doing properly. Thank you. I'm going to take one last round. I've got a hand here, a hand there, and one last hand over there. Please, will you introduce yourself? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thomas from Bits University School of Governance. Thanks for the superb 
presentation. Um, my question is, what specific government uh, commissions or mechanisms do you think could have been best could have best addressed structural uh, crimes of apartheid, uh, both in the public and private sector? And given that it didn't take place, what do you think are the best ways now? And are there any precedents in other countries that actually did this well? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Peter Nzizula. I'm from Lucenti. I just want to make a quick follow up on the issue around the electric crime system. You mentioned uh, the fact that uh, political parties are constitutional instruments. I agree because the constitution says we have a party list proportional representation system, which in a sense put political parties in the mix and as you call it, they are political instruments. I mean, they are constitutional instruments. The same constitution says that these very people who are elected through this party system uh, must take oath of office uh, in terms of the constitution. Now, uh, in a sense, there is a balance that needs to be struck here. Firstly, the fact that these people are elected through the party system, they got into parliament through, you know, the party, you know, through the party. Now, uh, the allegiance naturally will be to the party. Now there is a oath of, of office in parliament. How do, you, how do you balance these two? The fact that they need to, uh, to, to pay allegiance to the party and the, and, the, and the constitution at the same time. The second point, uh, it relates to the system at local level, which is a mixed system. Uh, the PR, and then there is a constituency based system. And you mentioned in your response to uh, the first set of questions that we need to kind of use, or maybe you say the, the, the initial idea was that we will change to go towards the constituency based system. We have a system that is working at local level, uh, it is not working as, as we would like. Uh, do you think that is a system that we need to replicate elsewhere, say at the national and provincial level, given the fact that, in my sense, it is captured by these uh, constitutional instruments, the political parties, even the what uh, the what or constituency based uh, the councillors at that level now have to report to the party and uh, they are financed by the party, so they pay their allegiance to the party. So would you think we need to replicate that even though we see that it is not working as well? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I go across the room, I also might or just want to say I'm heartened by the fact that we, when it comes to um, the transparency of political parties and their funding, we now have a bill before the president, uh, the political party funding bill, through the uh, work of many civil society organizations in this room, led by my vote counts, uh, which has pushed to the point where there is now a bill uh, uh, where political parties uh, need to disclose their funding. It's sitting on the president's desk, and we need to put pressure on the president to sign this uh, bill into law. Um, I'm, 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 I'm referring to the conversation on the electoral system, interesting. But I think that um, considering what is happening globally um, and, and how compromised people are occupying um, the, the political moment, I, you know, it's important, I think it's important for us to reflect on why Zuma Roles in the first place, especially given the fact that why is it roles in the first place? Yes. Especially given the fact that now a lot of people who did support him then are actually saying that they did know his history before. So I think even before we talk about who the voters go for who has been put forward by political parties, we also need to interrogate why it is why it is how is it rather that certain individuals capture imagination and how, how is it that the same if i can use that um amongst us actually tend to support these people then you do say that his social progress which i wouldn't call it that uh, but I, I get what you're saying um but i mean the thing is everything that zuma has come and shown actually proves the fact that he should never have been an MEC of finance, 
you should never have been a deputy president, and most importantly, you should never have been a president uh, or, or, or ever been allowed to be a president. So I think, unless we reflect on particular positions that we ourselves have taken and, and went along with that, yeah. we're going to get another individual who's again going to capture yeah. the political. But let me see, this is happening all over the world. You see all over Donald Trump. 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 <laughs> you see a whole range of you see this, and there's a particular moment why individuals that are morally compromised, that are, are, greed, are known to be greedy in terms of money and so on, why they rise as part of a wider conversation on state capture. So I think it becomes important that the, the particular kind of individual that we support or who appeals to us at a particular moment must in fact be interrogated. And I think they're very hard questions that we need to ask of ourselves. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Zach, can I ask for your final comments, please? Okay. Firstly, you're right that it is the political that needs to be interrogated. And we all know what happened there. Uh, and, and the political manipulation of our society is, is really quite bad. And we had gotten into the... into believing that the means justify the end. So, the opportunists, and there are many political opportunists at this, uh, at this point in time, who want a particular kind of society, they get promised it by the president himself, and therefore, then it doesn't matter whether he is dishonest or not, and so on, and so on. We understand that the means we use are not so good, but it justifies the end because the end is what he is promising. He is promising a people's society at one level or another. So I think there is an approach on our side which quite often says that the means justifies the end. Uh, we learned some of that thinking during apartheid too, I think. And I think that that approach was adopted during the struggle uh, against apartheid, even by people like us. And it's very difficult after that, to say that approach of, uh, of, of, of means justifying the end and so on may have been justified, and it's a big may, during the times of apartheid when we were fighting in the struggle for justice, but that approach can never be justified in an open and democratic society. And my view is that that really uh, is the problem. And of course, I'm speculating here a little bit because, yeah, as far as local government is concerned, the difficulty is that, again, we have not put in place mechanisms to facilitate and capacitate local government. And when we drafted the constitution, we were very aware of that. And therefore, national and provincial government have the duty in the constitution to facilitate and capacitate local government and provide training and so on and so on, which we don't do. So that is part of the problem as far as local government is concerned. I think that the funding, the political parties question uh, is actually going to work uh, to a degree and it will be a very good, very good way forward. And finally, the crimes against apartheid. I think that, I think that there were just deals done at the time. There may have been deals done behind the scenes in 1994. Nobody has yet come out with them. The only explanation which I can think of is there was some kind of international negotiation in which quite wrongly the powers that be here might have, by implication or explicitly, agreed that we will leave these governments and these large institutions and these international crimes alone on the basis that of some understanding that these big, huge international companies and foreign governments and so on will help us in reconstructing our country. Uh, there may have been some kind of deal with every party being quite honest about it at the time, but 
we didn't understand that it is not a good idea to believe governments who have known to have been corrupt and miserable in the past in relation to apartheid, when they say, forgive us our actions now, we will help you in the future. I think that the temptation to believe some of these things is, is great, but again, if, if one were to go back, to believe that people who supported apartheid before are suddenly going to support the development of a free and equal society in this country if they are let off prosecution is, I think, a difficult thing. So my speculation is that that is what actually happened. And that is what continues to happen. And these kinds of deals will continue to be made. So we have to be very careful about how we structure what we do. So thank you very much. I think we'll end here. Well, no, no, that, that, oh, that question I thought I dealt with, which is that we've got to educate them. We've got to start this whole process of educating political parties and starting to raise this debate. Are you upholding the constitution? Are you upholding your political party? We've got to start that debate. It is a very, very important debate to be had. Once again, thank you, Zach, um, for your comments and uh, for your very uh, provocative uh, remarks. I think it's got our thinking going. Yeah, yeah. Just one uh, thing before I make some housekeeping announcements. Uh, Numboniso's uh, statement about the political moment being occupied by people who um, are compromised makes me wonder uh, whether there are any glimmers of hope. And I think of the Angolan case, which we're going to hear about in the first uh, session tomorrow morning. Whether what is happening in Angola now, what we are seeing um, with the change in political leadership and the, with the actions of the new political leaders offers us, um, it begins to offer us uh, some glimmer of hope, some view of what might be possible. And so um, I look forward to that session very much. Uh, at the same time, of course, um, we have the case of Brazil where things might go very badly in the next election. And what does that mean, in fact, for this global uh, conversation that you are beginning to have. With that, um, let me just make some housekeeping announcements. Uh, toilets, uh, if you go out the door to your right, you'll see the signs uh, there to your right uh, down that way. The second thing is, um, please, you saw, there's a note up there, please join us this evening after the uh, end of this session, uh, which ends at 7.30. We're going to have a cocktail session at eight o'clock. I mean, sorry, eighteen hundred hours, six o'clock, with um, the, the well-known uh, comedian Conrad Koch and his puppet Chester Missing. So we're going to have hear the lighter side of state capture this evening. Please join us for that. And then um, finally, uh, we are going to now divide this room into two, and the two parallel sessions are going to happen on either side of this wall. Uh, just to remind everybody um, and to make sure that you are comfortable with it. We are live streaming uh, this conference, and that's why you see cameras at the back. But we, are also, we also have um, uh, two colleagues from um, uh, Ngomso taking uh, notes. Uh, they're going to compile a report of this conference, which we're then going to use um, for the next steps in the process. So um, please, if, uh, ju just make sure that you are please comfortable uh, with being uh, live streamed. And if uh, you're not, uh, please let us know. Thank you very much. Let's take a break and let's return in 20 minutes at 11 o'clock uh, to two separate rooms. On either side, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, this is gonna be closed off now. How are you? I'm good, I'm I'm fine, how are you?